CSI driver internals. For those of you that aren't aware of who I am, I'm currently the CTO and co-founder of Sivo. Um, I've been a programmer for a long time using languages such as Delphi and uh, C++, a little bit of Java, although I don't like to talk about it, um, Assembly, and then most recently Ruby and Go. Um, I'm available on Twitter. My handle is in the bottom left. So if you have any questions after the talk, feel free to reach out to me on Twitter and I'll try and help as best I can. Um, I'd appreciate any follows because we've got a bet going between me and Mark Boost, the CEO. So any follows greatly appreciated. I'm going to start plugging that in every meetup. Great. So you've made a container. Hopefully everyone on the call knows what a container is. <coughs> and you write some persistent data to it. So let's say it's a MySQL database and it's your, your literal data or you're running a WordPress container and it's configuration options or uploaded images and everything is great. But then what happens when you move that container to another machine? Because we're in a Kubernetes world and we have multiple worker nodes. Well, that's right, it's blank page time again. All your data's gone because it's sitting on the hard drive in machine one and your now container is running on machine two. This obviously doesn't work. If you're running stateful workloads, you need storage. So if we think about it in real world terms, let's imagine that you have a bunch of USB sticks and you need to keep them somewhere nice and secure. So they can't be stolen, can't be used by two people at any one time. Um, obviously, ideally in a container-based world, we want lots of these vaults distributed around the cluster and coordinated rather than just one central set of storage. You also need a nice guard dog to protect access to these to make sure that only one person is using them at any one time and who's got which drive. So in the real world, if you think about it as these steps, the first stage is to go and get a drive from the vault and you plug it into your computer. Now, yes, I know that's not the right kind of plugging in image, but I couldn't find a better one on uh, image searches. The second step is that you, there's some technical matrixy stuff taking place. So for Windows users, this maybe is taken care of a bit more by the operating system. If you're using Linux, you'll have to be doing a lot of this yourself. So things such as partitioning the drive, formatting it with a file system, so that's right now to a blank state, and then mounting it, so making it appear as a drive to the operating system. And CSI, or the Container Storage Interface, is a specification for doing exactly how to do those things in a way that plays nicely with Kubernetes. So when you're writing a CSI driver, there's three main parts. The first part is what's called the controller. And if you think of that as the equivalent to the USB stick, it's about give me a new USB stick, plug it into this computer. The second part is called the node. And that's the technical matrixy stuff about partitioning and formatting um, and mounting the disk into a particular place. The third part is the much smaller part called identity, which is just this is the name of my driver and I am up and running. So Kubernetes communicates with a CSI driver via gRPC. Now, this is a, an API style invented at Google. Um, strangely, the G doesn't stand for Google, they say. It's just gRPC. But whereas REST, which is what a lot of web developers are used to, is more about the URLs, HTTP transactions, um, standard things like create, read, update, and delete on objects. RPC is more around do this action, so more of a sort of functional declaration. And if you haven't used gRPC before, it can be a bit hairy the first few times. <coughs> so you have to get into something called protobufs, which is how you encode one object and pass it into your RPC call, how you encode the response and pass it back. Fortunately, when you're writing a CSI driver, if you've never dealt with gRPC before, you don't have to worry about any of that. The reason is Kubernetes comes up with a nice little thing called sidecars. So the happy chappy on the bike is your CSI driver and the Kubernetes CSI group provides you with sidecars that do all of the gRPC voodoo and just call your methods that you have to define in your CSI driver. So at this point, we're great. We've got to write some code. It's got to implement some methods. We know this and we've got to run some standard Kubernetes sidecars. So the next question is, what are all these methods that we need to implement? And the first obvious 
way of finding this out is you go to the documentation like this wise old wizard and read through pages and pages of text to try and figure it out. When I was writing Sivo's CSI driver, I came up with another idea. I had a light bulb moment. There's something called the CSI Sanity Test Suite. And this is written by the Kubernetes project. And it's a way of checking to make sure you've implemented all the methods you're supposed to, and you are correctly sanitizing the input and providing the correct response. So the CSI Sanity Test Suite is 154 ready written tests. So these check that you're implementing all of the things you're supposed to implement. And you're correctly returning an error if something strange is passed into your driver. But you don't actually have to implement 154 tests. If you take away all of the optional functionality, you're left with just 98 tests that you actually have to fill out the details for. Now, if you're using Go, you'll be aware that it's a very fast language to compile. So if you're in a run the tests, fix what's broken next, rerun the test cycle, it only takes about half a second to run those 98 tests on my laptop. So your laptop may vary, but these are quick. So you get into a very quick development cycle. So the CSI driver has a bunch of different parts and they all map down to the things that we talked about in the physical world. The first stage is the startup part of the CSI, which is I'm a CSI driver called csi.sevo.com and I'm up and running. The next phase is what we'd call the create phase. So this is the, can I have a USB drive please to plug, in, plug into my node and the act of attaching it into the node. The second phase is called the use phase. And this is where we do things on the actual node itself, where we partition the drive, we format it, we mount it to the correct place. At this point, if we have a pod that's using this volume, it's going to keep running forever and it's all happy. If you um, kill the pod at this point or the pod dies for some reason, it goes through effectively the reverse operation. So there's the stop phase where it unmounts the drive and makes it available for use by something else. And then there's a cleanup phase. Now, this really is in two halves. The first part is detaching it from that computer or the node, the Kubernetes node. And the second half is I've truly finished with it. The customer has deleted the PVC, actually delete the volume now and stop charging me for any more use space. So if we look at each of these parts, we can describe what the CSI methods are that you need to implement. The first stage, startup. This is the equivalent of turning the system off and on again, the boot cycle. So the two methods you need to implement is get plugin capabilities where you tell it what the driver's name is and what you can do. So which of the optional features you implement. The second one is probe. This is called often by Kubernetes and it's the easiest method. You just have to return a response. If it returns the response, Kubernetes knows that your controller is still alive. Okay, so into the create phase. And again, I've kept a diagram at the bottom right of the screen so you can see which section this is. So, Get a USB drive and plug it in is the equivalent in the real world. And again, has two methods. The first one, create volume. This is when someone initially creates a PVC and then they try and attach it to a pod and it realizes there's no underlying volume. You have a claim to one, but no volume. So at this point, it calls the Sevo API, which in our case is using storage OS on NVMe drives, and it creates the, the volume in the storage layer. Now, if you keep watching after this talk for Dinesh's talk, we actually end up creating a Sevo volume at this point rather than directly with storage OS. And we have a custom Kubernetes operator that interacts with all of the supercluster level stuff. So Dinesh is gonna talk, talk to us all more about how we actually create an operator. The second method that we have to implement is control a publish volume. And this is the equivalent of plugging the USB drive in. So in our case, we talk to Kubevert and we say, you need to mount this volume onto this node. <clears throat> the second phase is the use phase. So at this point, we're operating on a specific Kubernetes worker node. And again, there's two calls. The first one is stage the volume, which is prepare it for being used. So partitioning, formatting, and mounting it to the drive somewhere. So we can determine where we want to mount that. 
The second call is to publish the volume, which is just very simple. It's a bind mount. So if you're not familiar with bind mounts, you can think of it really as a symbolic link. So I make a link from the path we've mounted it to into the specific require, uh, location for the container. So the container will then be able to write to that volume. Okay, so now if we think of it as we've now finished with the USB drive, we're unmounting it, but leaving it plugged in. Again, it now goes through the reverse steps. So the first stage is to unpublish it, which is to remove the bind mount. Then it's to unstage it, which is to remove the regular mount point. So at this point, if you're used to using USB drives, you can see this is when you right click and unmount the volume, but you leave the USB plug back in, plugged in, sorry. You can easily choose to remount it without having to detach and plug the drive in and out. The full stage is the clean up one, which is when we're giving the USB drive back and letting someone else use it. So again, from the controller level, we unpublish it. So in Sivo's case, we talk to Qvert and we say, we don't need this volume anymore. But at this point, there's no data loss. So if another pod is fired up in the future, providing we don't delete the persistent volume claim, the volume still remains. And finally, if we truly delete the persistent volume claim, then we delete the volume. So it entirely deletes the volume from the SIVO API, which trickles down into storage OS and deletes the volume there everywhere. And you don't pay for it anymore. So as a pseudo demo, we're going to just look through the logs of each of these device, of each of these parts of the driver and follow through the process. And if you're used to using SIVO Kubernetes, you can log into any of your clusters and view the same logs that we're going to see on the screen. So the first stage, we create the persistent volume claim and the pod. So if we look at the logs, you can see here at the top, it says cube system, CVO CSI controller in pink. The first one we see is the create volume. So here it's calling the CVO API and saying, create a volume of this particular size. And at some, it says the volume is created, but then after a few lines, so just before it sort of turns red in the center, you can see that it's actually waiting for the volume to go to a particular state and it's waiting for it to be available to plug in. It takes longer than the initial timeout for it to actually complete that. So this is a really important concept in CSI drivers. All of your methods need to be what's called idempotent, which means if the method is called with the same parameters, it needs to end up in the same state as it would do or error out. <coughs> So if we call create volume with a particular name 10 times, you should end up with one volume with that name, not 10 volumes with that name. So what Kubernetes does is it effectively does exactly the same thing. It calls create volume with the same name. And this time the API says, ah, oh, I've got the volume and it's available. We're okay to continue. So then the CSI driver gets the second call, which is the controller publish volume. Here again, it's a simple call to the CVO API to say, Given this instance ID and this volume ID, can you please connect them together? Then in the pink at the top again, we see we've moved into the CSI node. So this is the node part of the driver. And again, it makes the two simple calls. Stage volume, which is the first green line. You can see there that it's formatting it, it's mounting it to the initial path. And then it will call no publish volume, which is just creating a bind mount from the temporary path into the final place where the, the container is expecting to find these. Imagine we now delete the pod. So it follows back with the same two steps. The first stage is to unpublish the volume. So remove the bind mount. The second stage is to unstage it, which it doesn't need to do any wiping at this point. It just needs to remove the initial mount that it created. It will then call the unpublished volume in the controller. So this is the equivalent now of unplugging the USB. We haven't given it back into our vault yet, past our highly deadly guard dog. We're keeping hold of the USB drive, but we just said we don't need it plugged into a server right now. Then if you delete the PVC, the persistent volume claim, at that point, the final method is called. So at this point, it actually deletes the volume in the CVO API and everything's back cleaned up. So. When you're writing a CSI driver, you need to think about automated testing. Fortunately, you get a lot of the way for free. With CSI Sanity, 
they test to make sure that all of your inputs are sanitized, that if a volume is created with an empty name, you return an error. If a volume is created with a request of minus one gigabytes or zero gigabytes, you return an error. You can't have an empty volume. So that's done for you. The sidecars that the CSI project provides, they're automatically tested as well. So you don't need to worry about that. So the only thing you do need to write is the internal unit tests for your specific functionality. So in our case, we have a fake Sivo library, which has the same interface as our regular Sivo Go library, but it doesn't require an API server. So this means that we've written tests that use the same interface as our regular API server, but again, they operate in about half a second to run all of the tests. So your CSI driver is written and it's now time to install it into a cluster. <clears throat> there are four steps to this. So the first one is you need some RBAC definition. So we need to give the various parts of the driver various accesses to the underlying file systems, the underlying um, mount points that you need to be able to write um, to the disks. The second part is there's a Kubernetes resource called a CSI driver. Now this is really very simple. It's about 10 lines of YAML and it's literally just saying, I am a CSI driver type and my identifier is in our case, csi.sevo.com. This is mapped to a storage class for customers. So when you create a volume with a particular storage class, it looks up to see if there's a CSI driver that will handle that storage class. The third out of the four is a controller. So this is a stateful set, so it runs once in your cluster, and this is the only part that interacts with the external API. And it consists of your driver and the sidecars that call your gRPC methods. And finally, as we said, the node, which is a daemon set, so it runs on every worker node in your cluster. And again, it contains your driver code and the sidecars that interact with gRPC. You do have a choice here when you're writing this. At the moment, we're choosing to do things in a single driver code base. So we end up with a single binary and this is installed in both places in the controller and the node. If you prefer, you could split these out into two separate projects, two separate binaries and only run the code needed. But with Go, it's very tiny binaries and nice code organization. It makes sense for us to keep them in one place. So in summary, to write a CSI driver, you have to do a few very simple steps. One, write eight idempotent methods. So remember, idempotent means if it's called more than once, it should end up in the same good state. Ensure they pass a ready-built CSI sanity test suite. So this is the bare minimum for compliance to make sure that you will interact nicely with Kubernetes. Add your own tests for your specifics. So these are where you'd use a fake driver and deploy them with some standard sidecars out into a cluster. And that is as easy as CSI drivers are. Now, I'm sure there'll be some challenges as you come to try and do it. If there are, feel free to reach out over Twitter and I'll try and help. Um, we haven't released the source code to the CSI driver yet, but that may well be something we do if there's enough interest in it. It's not um, overly secret code. <clears throat>